By modern day standards, the actions of the Mile Creek murderers were war crimes and part of a deliberate state-sanctioned genocide of the Aboriginal people that today would be punishable by the rules of international criminal law. The fact that vast numbers of genocidal murders in colonial Australia went unpunished would today provide evidence of state sanction and would today justify international intervention in the prosecution of the perpetrators and their national leaders. While such laws did not exist in 1838, the approach taken by John Hubert Plunkett towards the two trials was consistent with them and demonstrated an enlightened and visionary attitude that was unparalleled in his time or for more than a century afterwards. John Plunkett did not just prosecute 11 men for murder. He prosecuted his entire society for its connivance in the attempted annihilation of the Aboriginal people and their culture. His contemporaries, consciously or subconsciously, appreciated that fact and as a result vehemently resented him during the trial and for years afterwards. And it was a testament that, to his persistence and tactical skills that he was able to convince 12 white jurors to convict seven of the perpetrators because they were not only condemning those men to their deaths but also stingingly rebuking their own society. While the trials and the convictions did not prevent future massacres, they stand as a beacon of humanity and interracial justice that illuminated the way for Australia to develop as a civilised nation until we recognise that what was perpetrated amounted to an attempted genocide that today would be recognised as a war crime. And until we teach this to our children throughout Australia, we will not have reached our full maturity as a nation. Well, when Cook was sailing up the east coast of Australia, he was well aware that there are Aboriginal people here. He called them Indian. I like to remind people that their imprints are deeply embedded in the land. These imprints, when they walked through the land thousands of years ago, as the first people, first custodians, they were here since time immemorial. Everything we ever needed came from the land. And I look back there and think of 228 years ago when people came to this country that we all call Australia our home now. I've been trying to trace my family history because you get to this stage of your life and you want to know who you are. And a couple of times now I've actually driven down to the Glen in this Inverell, Armidale, Tinga area. And having met my um, natural grandmother for the first time was very emotional. But the stories that she started telling me of our Indigenous heritage just made me come together. It was like my stomach all fitted together and um, I naturally then understood why my children learnt the didgeridoo, my paintings in the house are Indigenous paintings because it's actually in me and I, I feel that very strongly. We have been here for 21,000 years on this island. Over in the Kimberleys over in Western Australia, they're coming up, research there has come up with a figure of almost 70,000 years. The, the original inhabitants of this land have the oldest living culture in the world. Aboriginal people, I believe, stick to their law. They're an honest, they're honest people, and I think they stuck to the law 
and, and even used that when, when Cook's men were there. So they allowed the, the white strangers to be there, repair their boat and hopefully keep moving. Many years ago, I'm figuring, you know, in the late 18th century, uh, the local stockmen actually rounded up the um, native people of the area and herded them towards the edge and then actually pushed them over. Other people who have spoken to me about Mile Creek Massacre, they've gone there and they have felt, they have felt it. At the time, I think it was about 1880, the newspaper like was called the Queenslander and you wouldn't believe what was openly written there by people saying thing, um, where have all the, where has all the vermin gone from this land that once lived on this land? Thing really new, and they were talking about the Aboriginal people. You know, 18 years after Cook, after that journey with Cook uh, sailing up the east coast, 18 years later was the, the arrival of the first fleet and that was the end of life, life for Ab Aboriginal people as they knew it at that time. from the 12 heads of the family. Every tribe has 12 elders that run the tribe. And the dolphin is said to be the protector of all of the creatures from the ocean. And those two are brothers and they belong to the emu. Now, the Australian coat of arms, we have the emu and the kangaroo. The same in the Aboriginal societies. All the tribes, every tribe in Australia has both emu and kangaroo people living within that same tribe. Yes. Um, and has anyone ever seen a turtle? They, either, they don't make a sound, they either get eaten by a predator or die in the heat, so we need to bring them into the water so they, so they can reduce the amount of sea turtles in the water. And then, uh, thank you, we have um, over there, a different type of mangrove. And what's on this you can see there, on the leaf? Milk. Yeah, it's milk. Because it's got milky sap. <laughs> so that's the uh, milky. Now this mangrove is actually quite poisonous. So don't touch this sap, because they call it blind your eye mangrove as well. But it has all sorts of medicinal uses, right? They use it for medicine. Lots of traditional communities, like indigenous communities in Darwin and in Solomon Islands, they use this for medicine. So if you get stung by a stonefish or a stingray, you can put this sap on yourself. Now don't try that at home kids, but that's a traditional medicine that's used from this tree. When we put the leaves in the fire and let up the smoke, the power of the creator is in the leaves and the smoke, and that's why it's so powerful to drive away any bad spirits. Another Bay of M Australia Day Great Aussie Moment with Auntie Joan Henry, Kwandamuka woman from Minjeraba. Everything we ever needed came from the land. And if we just stop for a minute and take a look back there and think of 228 years ago when people came to this country that we all call Australia our home now. And if we think of 
what the culture was in those days. Not like they dress now, getting off boats and that. All their brass buttons and red coats and all the stuff that they wore and the way the women dressed. And here they come to this country, pull into the shores. They don't see any houses, no prisons, no jails, no fences. This, what to them was nothingness. But they saw these people who had no clothes on, who had no house. And thus begin the timeline travel of colonisation of this country. Up until 1967, when the referendum happened, our people were virtually counted with the flora and fauna, more like being animals than people. Another Bay FM Australia Day Great Aussie Moment with Peter Hudson, artist from Mullaney. Aboriginal people have been here on, on the Australian continent for a long, 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 long time. You know, 18 years after Cook, after that journey with Cook uh, sailing up the East Coast, 18 years later was the, the arrival of the first fleet. That was the end of life for Aboriginal people as they knew it at that time. So, and I've spoken to Aboriginal people about the fact that prior to Cook's journey and, and, and settlement, Aboriginal people at least had this wonderful continent to themselves for a long, long time. It was inevitable that someone was coming. Someone was coming. It was an un, you know, it was, whether it would be the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, um, someone was going to come and take it. But at least they had it to themselves for a nice long run. What we have to do now is know the whole story. We all need to know exactly what happened to Aboriginal people. And we need to learn about Aboriginal people, how, how sophisticated and knowledgeable. The way they treated this country is a credit to them. So it's a tragedy that we didn't learn from Aboriginal people how to look after the place. Another Bay FM Australia Day Great Aussie Moment with Wendy Baglari, Redlands Councillor and Deputy Mayor. In the last 10 years I've been trying to trace my family history because you get to this stage of your life and you want to know who you are. And a couple of times now I've actually driven down to the Glen Innes, Inverell, Armidale, Tinga area because that's where my natural family came from and having met my um, natural grandmother for the first time was very emotional but the stories that she started telling me of our Indigenous heritage just made me come together. It was like my stomach all fitted together and um, I naturally then understood why my children learnt the didgeridoo, my paintings in the house are Indigenous paintings because it's actually in me and I, I feel that very strongly. And on one of the trips um, going out there, um, I saw a, 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 like a, a mountain and it had a, a, a sheer face on it facing us and I was feeling very um, agitated, like um, anxious uh, as we were approaching it and uh, some of the people in the car started talking to me about a story there how many years ago, I'm figuring, you know, in the late 18th century, uh, the local stockmen actually rounded up the um, native people of the area and herded them towards the edge and then actually pushed them over um, that cliff. And I think other people who have spoken to me about Mile Creek Massacre, they've gone there and they have felt, they have felt it. And this was before the actual monument was put there so that you actually knew what happened. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that before we were driving there. Driving towards it, it, it it's intense. You, you can feel that from the area. And I think it's really important that these, though they're horrific, they are our Australian history and, and we need to acknowledge that this has happened and we need to have the monuments which is now like at Mile Creek and we need to know this history because it is part of who we are and as I'm discovering who I am personally um, looking into my family and I, I hope to go down there again this year and learn more it 
makes you understand why when you see these areas that whether it's the spirit or, or what is captured there that affects people so strongly and it's not always people with indigenous blood it, it's it, it's just your normal traveler and um, we need to acknowledge these horrific acts that, that happened in our past. Another Bay FM Australia Day Great Aussie Moment with Bill White from Coo Adu. So we have Australia Day. Um, uh, it's something that I warm to because um, I guess I'm pretty enthusiastic and patriotic about being Australian. And so I think every Every community needs celebrations, and as a nation, uh, I guess I could pick of three logical dates. Uh, one would be the 1st of January, because I believe that was the date that the Federation began. And of course, that's a whole political story in itself, about trade-offs and uh, the various territories trying to get preeminence. Another one is, I think it's either the 18th or the 19th of January. Um, the reason that you might celebrate that day is that's the day that uh, the first week got to Botany Bay and then they found that it wasn't really full of the provender that Cook's Journal thought it, that it was because Cook turned up at a very, um, a very great time for the landscape to be, to be beautiful. But, or the other one is the 26th of January which is what we settled on and that's the day that the, that the, that the uh, flag went into Sydney Cove. And of course, Sydney Cove turned out to be a much better option than Botany Bay. And so there was this surge of nationalism and then you had a bicentenary coming up. So that was the early 80s, a bicentenary coming up in um, 1988. And I guess uh, that, that surge of uh, nationalism fueled um, a whole renewed interest in Anzac Day. And I think that that probably relates to coming down and having a Foundation Day, which is the 26th of January.